It's probably my fault that we do these programmes without sufficient breaks built in, because I like to get through as much as possible, so I apologise for that. Uh, but without further ado, we want to move on to this next session. Uh, can and should Parliament take back control from the executive? And I'm delighted we've got a fantastic panel here to discuss these issues. On my far right, Mark Darcy, who's been parliamentary correspondent for the BBC for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. Almost 20 years. Anniversary is this, this Easter. Oh, fantastic. So all but 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, to my immediate right, uh, Professor Meg Russell, who, as well as being a senior fellow with the UK in a changing Europe, is director of the Constitution Unit at UCL and is in the process of finishing up a book on Parliament during the Brexit process. I don't know if that's a sore point or not, the book. But anyway, I've mentioned it now, so you've got to do it. Uh, on my far left is Karen Bradley. Karen has been MP for Staffordshire Moreland since 2010 uh, and is chair of the Parliamentary Procedure Committee, which was elected in January of last... I'm losing track. Two years ago, 2020. 2020. And last but not least, Nikki DaCosta, the first ever, I think, Director of Legislative Affairs within Number 10, worked for both Theresa May and Boris Johnson, brings a host of, I imagine, well, certainly expertise and I imagine memories uh, about the interplay between government and parliament. So just, just to kick us off, I mean, Mark, you've got 20 years of experience, and, and in terms of that sort of vast sort of experience, where, where do things stand in terms of relations between government and parliament now compared to earlier times? Well, I think the parliament of 2019 is a pretty strange beast. Um, one of the things to remember about it is that most of its members are still learning their trade a bit. Um, at a time when they would, in, in previous parliaments, have been sort of safely bedded in and become wise in the ways of Westminster. You're talking about a period of getting on for a year and a half where they weren't really in parliament very much and where debate was, in any event, when they were in, pretty restricted. The virtual chamber was, uh, I think, a pretty poor substitute for real parliamentary debate. You never had the whites of a minister's eyes rolling under pressure, the beads of sweat forming on the forehead as the, as the crowd rounded on them, because ministers could deal with a fairly stately procession of speakers in a known order, and they'd always have a fairly good idea of where the next question was coming from. And naming no particular former education secretaries or former community secretaries, I can think of a number of people who might not have survived some uh, goings over in the Commons during that period. So that's part of it. And then, and then there's, the, if you like, the craft skills of being an MP how to function in committee, how to function in select committee, how to get legislation sort of amended, tweaked or whatever, are things that, that this generation of MPs, through no fault of their own, are late in absorbing because those processes haven't been in play in, in, in their full sort of state uh, for most of their parliamentary experience. And they, they're gathering speed now, I think, uh, uh, some of them are kind of gathering round assorted gurus and sitting at their feet, you know, learning the ways of Westminster a bit. Uh, and so things are improving, but it's an odd state to be in. And the other point I make is a kind of meta point, really. We're now at a, uh, which applies to earlier generations of MPs. We've now had a period of about six years when there has been a great overriding issue, not necessarily the same issue, but first it was Brexit, then it was COVID, and now it's Ukraine. And I think during that period, a lot of the kind of other issues that would normally be the stuff of politics, while they might have been going on, there's been a lot less steam and force and attention behind them. And I think that's beginning to show in threads of policy away from those great issues. Because, uh, and, and there's a certain sense of unravelment about some of it that I, I, I think uh, future governments will be picking up those threads for quite a while to come. I mean, in, in terms of picking up threads, I want to sort of talk to you two a little bit about this because you've got direct experience of working in or with Parliament. And that point that Mark made about parliamentarians still learning the ropes, is that, is that true, Karen? I mean, do you, do you feel that? Do you, how do you notice it? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, 
I want to pick up on one point Mark made about the hybrid parliament and it being a poor substitute. Nobody denies it was a poor substitute, but it was better than nothing. Yeah. And we were one of the few national parliaments that actually sat through the whole pandemic. And I absolutely agree that there was, you know, the whites of the eyes were not seen. It wasn't just a case of you pretty much knew who was coming next. You knew exactly who was speaking next because the tech meant that there had to be a call list that was absolutely set out as to who the next speaker would be. So I think we it did fail to deliver the kind of scrutiny uh, and keeping ministers on their toes and keeping ministers from uh, challenging their officials. I, I have been a minister and I can tell you that if you know you're going to get a question on a sticky subject, a UQ or something like that, where you're going to be asked repeatedly about the same thing, you challenge the officials to make sure that you have every answer that might be needed. So, so I think, you know, we didn't have that. There was no doubt about it. But it did sit. And we did at least allow some scrutiny. And certainly towards the latter part of the lockdown, I think we saw, we saw MPs start to um, get the confidence to actually start to challenge in that forum. It's very difficult to challenge in a forum where, right at the beginning, we weren't even having divisions. And once we started to have divisions and people realised that they could start to challenge, I think things did improve. There were technological changes we could have brought in and could have could have tried, like, for example, virtual interventions, which would have meant for more dynamic um, debate, but that was not something Parliament chose to go down that route. Um, we instead obviously wanted to go back as soon as we could to the traditional way of sitting. But then going to that point about um, the way the Parliament feels, it doesn't feel like a Parliament that is three years old. It feels like a Parliament that is very new. And there is still a tribalism um, in Parliament. I mean, one of the things that you realise very quickly, and I came in in 2010, so it was coalition, but you realise very quickly that actually, you know, the line of we have more in common than, than, than the divides us is absolutely true. And there's only 650 people at any one time who were going through the experience of being an MP. And it's a unique experience. Every parliament is different. Every parliament feels different. And you will have people who actually, on opposition benches, who you might disagree with on policy, but actually you have an awful lot in common with um, as an individual. And um, we've not had that coming together of cross-party groups in a physical format until very recently. And that's the thing that breaks down the barriers. That's the mm. thing that actually helps you to get your job done. There's an awful lot as a backbencher you can only do if you work across party on issues. If you've got a campaign you want to run, you need it to be cross party so that you can demonstrate to the speaker it's worth calling the amendment, you can demonstrate to the government that there's a there's a will to get things done. But you can't work cross party if you're all very tribal. And I think it's only now that we're starting to see some of those tribal divisions break down and Parliament will be much more effective as an institution if we have got um, much closer cross-party party working on common issues. And with the 2019 intake, do, you, do they still feel like new kids? Uh, do they still act like new kids? I, I don't think they, they act like new kids. I mean, it's very offensive to say to someone who's been an MP for three years yeah. that you're a new kid, but they are finding their feet in terms of the way procedures work because they simply didn't have the chance to look at the many, many different ways that you can raise issues. You know, for example, a petition. So you can submit a petition, present a petition on behalf of your constituents at the close of business every single sitting day. There is an mm. opportunity to do that. Those petitions, actually, they don't, they might seem quite minor compared to the big Downing Street petitions where you get the debate in Westminster Hall. But on a local constituency issue, presenting the petition is really important. Well, you couldn't do that mm. in in a virtual parliament. So that's just one little tool that I know can make a big difference for your constituents that, that MPs are still finding about, uh, finding out about. And I think that's, we will see, I suspect, over the course of the next two years, a change in the way that these kind of um, uh, opportunities are used mm. by particularly 2019 intake when they realise that there are so many opportunities to raise their issues and it's not just a case of turning up to every statement and putting in to speak in every debate. Okay. I would like to think that some of them are still getting lost on the estate quite regularly though. <laughs> so, well, I was, <laughs> told, I was told the story that on his very last day as an MP, Tony Benn was shown a new route round Parliament. So I think it's fair <laughs> to say that we all are finding our feet getting 
around Parliament, even those of us who've been doing it for 12 years. And, and, and Nikki, I mean, your job's a bit like herding cats at the best of times, the job you had in Number 10. Was that, was that made worse by the specific circumstances of a virtual Parliament? I was on maternity leave for some of the right, period, yeah. so I, I have to. I came back in in October 2020. I think you, just to differentiate with the bits of the system in, in government, which manage legislation, you have the whips office, yeah. which will deal with the 24/7, i.e., what's the vote that's coming yeah. up in the week ahead, um, and how do you handle that? Um, and they will be doing much more of the the arm around the shoulders. Without a doubt, their their jobs became a lot lot harder. Yeah. Um, partly because. The, the role of the whips should really be an, an HR function in many ways. It's it's not tran it shouldn't be transactional. It should be about building a relationship with your particular flock, such that when you have to ask them a question about a piece of legislation or where they are on a vote, then you have it's not just a oh how are you going to vote on this. It, you're doing it in the context of a relationship. But what you have with a virtual parliament is it becomes much more about, OK, there's this, this X issue, I'm going to phone them up, I'm going to ask them about that specific thing. And that breaks down the degree of information that might be exchanged, the degree to which the MP might feel comfortable expressing where they are. And then that means that the data that the WHIPS office gather is going to be that much more blunt, it's going to obscure potential things that are going on. Particularly if the MPs are not necessarily feeling familiar, they may feel the conversations are uncomfortable, they may again obscure where they are, mm -hmm. and so therefore it becomes much harder to manage a particular division. Right. Um, so in terms of my job, yes, in terms of, um, I mean, this is the most rebellious parliament, and we, we, you know, everyone tracks that. Uh, it is because we've been in government an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I go back to my days in opposition whips office, you know, and the only thing we had to give out was office space. And I used to remember that whenever an MP was standing down, the little notes used to come in and say, oh, so-and-so has got an awfully nice office. Could you consider me? I mean, that was the extent of your patronage in opposition. Mm. And I think that government MPs, because we've been there for so long, have grown complacent about the benefits of being in government, which used to act as a restraining influence on rebellions. Right. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a tendency to bank, oh, I only got a hospital and X million pounds invested in the constituency. But, ah, you know, that's not enough to bind me for the next vote. You know, what's, what's the next bit? And so you've got, you've got all of that coming together to make it much harder to manage the parliamentary party, in addition to not having that social contact. Go on, Karen. Could, could I just add something to that? Because I'm absolutely right. But the other thing that was missing during lockdown was the WHIPS office, WHIPS interactions with departments. Mm -hmm. So the job of the WHIP is not just to get the MPs to vote through the division lobby, walk through the division lobby. It's also to manage the departments, to make sure they're not bringing forward policies that MPs will automatically... I mean, right. don't use your political capital up on getting MPs to vote for something they hate when you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And if you've not got WHIPS sat in the departments, every every single week, and I've been a whip as well, the part of the job is sitting in the department and going through what the policy agenda is and saying, you're going to have a problem with that, that's not going to go down well, and that was missing as well. So, so it was twofold, it was both not being able to put your arm around people in, in, as MPs in the tea room, but also not being in the departments to manage departments coming through with things that MPs were going to explode over. Okay, and, and Meg, you've spent as much time as anyone, I think, reflecting on Parliament and its role in our system. I mean, where, where do you think we are in well, historical terms? Um, I think we're not in a very happy place, to be honest. I mean, a lot of my work um, over the last 20 years or something has been arguing that Parliament is a more powerful actor than we think, that there's lots of subtle influences that go on behind the scenes, uh, that this idea of executive dominance is a bit of a myth, as we were talking about on the last panel. But actually, I think we've seen a turning of the corner in, in recent years. Um, you know, you're not plugging your own report, Anna. So this, this report <laughs> that is being published today... I'm where trying I, to turn the iPad on. Where, where uh, I am flattered and delighted to have the first chapter in, um, it asked us to reflect under three different headings. One, Brexit, two, COVID, and three, Boris Johnson. And those things have kind of... Well, no, they haven't followed exactly in that sequence. But... All of them have taken us in rather unhealthy directions, I think. I mean, under Brexit, um, it was obviously a horribly difficult situation. You had a minority government that was trying to deliver a controversial referendum result, um, where its own party was completely split. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is very, very difficult and creates a tendency, a mindset, which I think, you know, Nikki has freely admitted to being part of this operation, which, which seeks quite a lot to exclude Parliament, because Parliament's kind of a dangerous place to be if you're in that situation as a government. Um, 
And, and that builds on a general view, which always exists in the civil service, that the more we can get done without sort of parliamentary interference, the better, because we, we know best. Um, ultimately, that ended up, obviously, with the prorogation, which was kind of a huge and, and difficult moment. And also, I think, very important in this context, um, the expulsion of the 21 Conservative rebels um, in, on the 3rd, 4th of September 2019. Um, by the brand new Prime Minister, which creates a sense of uneasiness, I think, in the parliamentary party when a Prime Minister is prepared to be as brutal as that. Well, Both of those things <laughs> upset the balance, I think. Um, and then we, we had lots of headlines about Parliament through that period, lots and lots of negativity about Parliament in the media. We had things like um, the Attorney General saying that Parliament's got no right to sit. Uh, the Conservative manifesto accusing it of thwarting the will of the British people. So you've got a very clear kind of fight back against parliamentary power by the forces of the executive, I think. Then, just when we've had the general election in 2019, and we might be thinking we're going to get back to some kind of normality, because we've got a majority government again, Brexit, those Brexit arguments are primarily behind us, then we get COVID. And that had the effects that other people have spoken about in terms of the sort of cultural effects inside Parliament. But what I don't think anybody yet has mentioned is the, the effect on the legislative process that it had, which had some emergency legislation, but then more importantly, a huge reliance um, on delegated powers mm -hmm. in secondary legislation, which MPs and peers had barely any opportunity to look at, often things coming into force before they'd even been laid before Parliament, which created a real sour... It was very unhealthy, I, I think, on a principal basis, but also it created a real sour mood on the Conservative backbenches um, and led to some major rebellions, which then did see some eventually rowing back on the part of the government. You've then got, on top of that, sort of Boris Johnson's character, which I think, you know, his, his premiership is shaped by those events, clearly. Um, and, and I think an executive that's getting into the habit of trying to get stuff done without the usual kind of uh, consultation with Parliament. So we've seen bills being rushed through very quickly. We've seen um, government amendments at very late stages of legislation in the House of Lords. We've now got worries about various kind of fast track procedures that are being proposed. So the whole Brexit freedoms bill idea looks like there's a potential there to have a whole new kind of delegated legislation to make major policy changes without proper, I would say proper uh, reference to Parliament and proper sort of healthy levels of scrutiny. And we've got the stuff about human rights as well. And I think the thing that concerns me about this, one of the things that concerns me about it is uh, that adage, which um, I worked more than 20 years ago for Robin Cook when he was leader of the House of Commons. And he, he used to say, good scrutiny leads to good government. And I think we've heard that already from the panel. If you dodge scrutiny, the risk is you take bad decisions and you regret it later. There are good reasons for conferring with Parliament, doing things out in the open, as, as Karen was saying. You know, when you're a minister and you know you've got to defend something in Parliament, you think through really, really carefully what it is you're doing and whether it is defensible. And if the government gets out of the habit of doing that, it's an unhealthy parliamentary culture and there's a risk that it also leads fundamentally to bad policy. And I think we need to get out of this now. I think we've got a very fragile position at the moment, and we need to get back to um, better principles of parliamentary scrutiny and um, consultation. OK, Meg's just gone through my whole list of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we'll come back to SIs, we'll come back to urgency, we'll come back to parliamentary time in a minute. But I'll, I'll let you come back if you want to, Nikki. I get the sense you don't wholly agree with yeah, yeah, Meg's uh, characterisation. Because I think there is this, this default, and, and Meg in her characterisation does not mention the fact that we have this conflict because of the referendum between a direct command from the public, which was a majority command, and parliamentary democracy in which the MPs are going against a command that the government has been instructed to fulfil. And in that context, it's absolutely right. That's where you get the tension because you've gone directly to the public. And when you therefore, so, so this idea, and, and I, I always want to try and break this down, when people say it's parliament versus the executive, we have an executive drawn from parliament who gains the legitimacy through majority government. And so when people say, is Parliament stronger? Well, we need to break it down. Do you mean, is it that the government is stronger vis-a-vis -vis the opposition? Is it the Commons versus the Lords? What relationship are we focusing on here? And then I would break further down in terms of the particular trends. You know, if we look at the amount of hours spent on legislation, if we look at the way of amendments, etc., 
there is a tendency, and I believe it is influenced by a political lens, and I'll, you know, with, with you know, and I see it with there's a there's a subtext, and it's a little bit like a, a white hall. Um, mode of thinking, and I, I see it come through with the Hansen Society Institute for Government, UKIC, the document, where it is Parliament by its very nature, more is good, versus the electorate send the MPs to Parliament to deliver on the manifesto. And the government gains its authority for doing that, and the point of Parliament is scrutiny, but also to enact the legislation that the public have voted for. And therefore, executive control is not in itself a bad thing. Now, the question is about where the, 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 the boundaries are. So to pick up on the issue of 21 MPs, these were not novices in rebellion. It was the end of a very long, you know, I served both Theresa May and Boris. And one of the problems under Theresa May was we never drew the line. We always said, let's be more reasonable. You know, we must show that we are the reasonable ones. And it got us precisely nowhere. <laughs> And so you have a new prime minister come in, and he is coming in at the end of a game in which parliament is already deadlocked, which is already legislated, I think, at least three times against the last prime minister. And in that situation, it's that. So where is the accountability? And the, the point was, we couldn't get to a general election. There was no way of breaking it because of fixed term parliament act. And in that situation, there are very, very few levers for the executive to deliver on an instruction from the public. Can I, can I there, is, there, there is a can theology, can I, an ideology can I, can I coming in. One through. second. I mean, oh, yeah. just we're going to yeah. talk about prorogation in yes. a sec. I sense, but uh, <laughs> I mean, the first thing is, wasn't Boris Johnson guilty of exactly that crime under Theresa May? Then that Theresa May was fulfilling a mandate from the British people to do Brexit. She had a Brexit deal, and Boris Johnson, amongst others, were voting against it. That presumably irritated you every bit as much. Yeah. I, and you'll have seen, and I was always very consistent. I will always, you know, I, 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 and from the sidelines, you know, arguing about how we achieve it. But there was, it's, it's legitimate. The parliament got to a situation where it wouldn't vote for anything. And we saw that through the indicative votes, etc. It wasn't that parliament had an alternative plan. It just didn't want to do anything, nor would it let the public decide, nor would the opposition let the public decide. Hmm. And that is not an acceptable way for parliament to behave. Meg, I mean, Mark and Karen, if you want to chip in, then do. I'll give Meg the next word and then I'll come back to okay. um, yeah, you. Okay. We're, we're, we're in danger of taking each other's lines because you just took one of mine there. But um, I completely agree with Nikki that it's, it's, it's a bit futile to talk about parliament versus government. Um, and this is something which I've also echoed in my work a lot. I quote this classic piece by Anthony King, which was written in 1975, saying, when you're talking about Parliament, who is it that matters? And he said, it's the government backbenchers that matter, actually. And this was not an institutional row, I don't think, between government and Parliament. It was a story, and it's somewhat obscured, I think, by the fact that we had a minority government, which is actually a fairly unimportant thing in the bigger scale of things, which was that we had a, di a divided governing party. We had a divided government, we had a divided cabinet, but we certainly had a divided parliamentary party. So yes, I mean, if you think that um, action should have been taken more quickly to stamp down on that rebellion, Boris Johnson, Priti Patel, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and various others would have been thrown out of the Conservative Party well, in the, early 2019. Yes, but but you, the, start, you start, it's notable that you choose that rebellion to focus on and not the rebellions that started with the EU withdrawal bill in terms of an insertion of customs amendments. And that for me is a political choice yeah, as to which cadre of MPs that you're choosing to focus on. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, I wonder if Theresa May, as she stepped across the threshold of Downing Street as Prime Minister, realised quite what a hiding to nothing she was mm. on. Uh, as Meg was saying, uh, her, her cabinet, her party were all incredibly divided. And they had an instruction, as Nikki says, from the British people. But an instruction to do what? Because that instruction did not cover whether we were in or out of the customs union. It didn't cover whether we were uh, in or out of the single market. It didn't cover a host of questions raised by Brexit. And there's a... And, a serious problem there, because uh, you, you had the interlude when David Cameron was still Prime Minister after the referendum, when it wasn't right for him to try and answer those questions. And then you had the interlude after Theresa May became Prime Minister, when she was trying to answer those questions and come up with an answer. And we had mantras like Brexit means Brexit to kind of fill the gap for a while. And during that time, you could see the splits yawning ever wider within the Conservative Party. And the real problem they had there is what on earth was she supposed to do? Did she try and impose a vision 
and then see enough of her colleagues vote with the opposition to bring her down? Did she try and get everybody together uh, in a sort of group hug and say, hey, we're all conservatives, let's work together, we've just about got a majority, and we can always ask the DUP for a bit of help, which I think was essentially what she tried to do for a while. Um, but what she couldn't do, and which a lot of people seem to think she should have done, was to have reached across to the other parties to assemble a so soft Brexit consensus, which would have shattered the Conservative Party to smithereens for about three generations. So no, no palatable and or workable options were available until such point as there was a stamp of authority. Now, um, Boris Johnson came in and the prorogation manoeuvre fairly rapidly followed uh, uh, as a way of trying to break the deadlock. But that seemed to generate a far bigger backlash than he could ever have conceived of. Then we saw the expulsions. Then we finally saw the snap election, which gave him a majority for his way out. But the idea that, you know, it's, it's not a very pretty way of assembling a consensus around a great national question like Brexit, to put it at its gentlest. And I'm not sure that even the election manifesto on which he ran really answered all the questions raised by Brexit. I'm not sure anybody ever, has now, and hell, we're, you know, best part of five years on from it. And, and here we are still sort of stuck wondering what's going to be done about certain essential questions. So it's an extraordinarily ugly situation. And Blaming the weaknesses on Parliament of this, what you got was a, a process where the whole country was split down the middle, and it's extraordinarily difficult, therefore, to resolve any questions on it. And Theresa May was left trying to party like she was Tony Blair in 1997 without having gone through the small formality of securing a majority of that size. Hence the mess. Well, I mean, it, with, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, could Theresa May have done this, given the situation she was in? I mean, was it hiding to nothing, as, as Mark puts it? You well, want... well, I just wanted to come in to say that, I mean, there is this, we're having this discussion about Parliament and the strength of Parliament, and one of the reasons we were in the situation we were in, and it's been referred to already on Brexit, was the withdrawal agreement, uh, the withdrawal bill, and the meaningful vote that was inserted largely by rebels from my own party um, that, may, that men meant that there had to be a meaningful vote in Parliament. And once that meaningful vote was passed, Parliament actually had the key. Parliament was the only body that could possibly decide whether Brexit would happen or not. And, and what Parliament then failed to do was to act to actually deliver it. So, you know, we've said this already, and I, I'm just making another point that, that this was a situation. But I would also go back to um, another point Point that has been raised in light of Ukraine, which is that vote that we had, you'll recall, on the Syrian intervention back, mm -hmm. I think, in 2013. <laughs> and their parliament, um, it was a very strange situation because there was a, a motion that the government put forward and an amendment put forward by the opposition, which were almost identical. The only difference between the two motions was that the government amendment said it had to be on humanitarian grounds, that the intervention had to be for humanitarian grounds, and the opposition amendment didn't say that. But what you saw was an opposition party that voted for their amendment and against the government motion, and a government that voted against the amendment but for their motion. It all fell down. Down, and it was Parliament showing that it wasn't actually that strong. And we can reflect, I'm sure, in years to come about the messages that that sent around the world about the strength of the UK Parliament and the Westminster Parliament. But there, you know, there are plenty of those that are speculating today that some of those failings and failings that happened around parliaments around the rest of the world perhaps strengthened Putin to feel he had, he could do what he has done in Ukraine. And, you know, everything does come back to you. I always say when I bring parliament out, bring constituents into parliament, I always make them walk past the war memorial. Because I say, if you don't as an MP and a parliamentarian look at this and remember that, you're, that you have life and death in your hands in a vote that you are taking, and it might not be life and death immediately after that vote, it might be many years down the line, but there are consequences of the way parliament behaves. Could I fire a quick question? For, forgive me, yeah, Karen, um, do you think that the Syria precedent still sticks, that there still has to be a vote in no. the Commons? No, because the, uh, the, there was then an intervention that did happen, a military intervention, and the vote was a, a confirmatory vote, mm. if you recall, after the action had been taken. So I think that that precedent has now been broken. But that was a, a really difficult precedent, which yeah. goes, you know, and it really it was a hangover from Iraq. It was something that, that actually dated back to 2003, but Parliament was still bitter about. Ten years later made the decision, and now nearly ten years down the line, perhaps 
perhaps we're reaping the consequences. And just to that specific point, explicitly, Theresa May rode, again, rode away yeah. from that in 2018. Um, the Cabinet manual is clear, uh, although we can debate the status of the Cabinet manual as an explicitly political document for political ends, um, in which there, you know, for, for urgency and the need to preserve the ability of the government to act swiftly in certain circumstances. And Theresa May both reaffirmed the movement away from the Convention, which I think believe, believe was very well received by officials in FCDO who had been absolutely horrified at the emergence of the Convention, mm. uh, and in addition that it is not necessarily a vote that follows, although more likely that there is a debate. Mm. And I think that any Prime Minister needs to consider quite considerably whether they then try and row back to the old the Cameron precedent that was starting to emerge, because I think there are uh, concerns relating to that and then your ability to project um, power internationally. Well, I want to just pick up... Did you want to...? Yeah, I just, I just, if I may, just, I mean, excuse me, I can rake over Brexit for at least 110,000 words and I can show you the, the, the proof, but um, you, you both mentioned, I think, the meaningful vote. And I think there is a very interesting, we, we have various what ifs in the book. There are lots of them. There are too many to fit in, even in, into 110,000 words. But one of the interesting questions is what if the meaningful vote hadn't been secured? And obviously, Nikki, you know, I've heard you talk about this. You were doing your best to stop it. Um, and I think it's a very valid question. But ultimately, we're forced to conclude that there would have, I mean, th there always had to be a meaningful vote of some kind, and the government had conceded that right from the start, because there needed to be implementing legislation. And I think there is a danger, there's a bit of the story which hasn't yet been mentioned, that there was part of the trouble in Parliament was that there was a group of MPs who, as Theresa May got pulled into some of the sort of compromises around Brexit, especially around the Northern Ireland border, who were prepared to go out all out for a no deal. Um, and then there's a counterforce, which is saying we have to stop no deal, um, which is where things got very, very nasty. If there had been no meaningful vote, there still would have been implementing legislation. And if the no dealers had voted down the implementing legislation, we would have crashed out without a deal. So it, I, th that is the case. But, but this is there the would have been a vote in the end, and it could yes. have been undermined by the rebels on the ERG side who wouldn't compromise. So you're seeing it on a single level as the conversation happening in the UK versus the conversation happening in the EU. And one of the things that, you know, Theresa May in sitting down with the rebels, particularly going back to those meaningful votes, was, and the guidance that we had back from Tim Barrow from across the Europe in terms of all the diplomats, was that, and she was being told, if she could go to council with her hands unbound, the dynamics of the negotiation would change. And I was told that repeatedly under Theresa May for all those that are focusing on the deal. And this is relevant, and it's relevant to the, then what we had to do under Boris, because we needed to get to October Council on the 16th of October with just the slimmest chance, and that was why the dates are as they are, to bring Parliament back before Council, so it's sitting, so it can consider a deal, but in creating the time for negotiations in which the EU perceived the dynamic has changed, and that Parliament will not come in to block the deal or to force the Prime Minister into a different direction. She has greater ability to negotiate. And so for me, the meaningful vote, and it comes back, you know, I remember the very, very distressing conversations that the Prime Minister had relating to that defeat in 2017, was that she said to people that she had been friends with for decades, can you not trust me to go and negotiate? I'm heading for a deal. And the answer was, no matter how long we've been friends, I don't, it's not that I don't trust you, Prime Minister. And there was always some justification. And you always hear it from rebels. Prime Minister, I'm only trying to help you by inflicting this particular defeat. You'll see, you know, it's for your own good. And, you, and I have to tell you, you know, for a woman Prime Minister, this is a particularly galling message. But this is the thing, it was never a single level at which this conversation was happening. And I tell you the result, when I left Theresa May over the deal, and I was on the outside, Clement Bone asked me to come to the, the French embassy. And we had a conversation there in which the question was, when do we put something on the table? When do you think we should do mm. that? There was something around, they would move, mm. but they were asking, what is Parliament going to do? When are they going to intervene? They were watching everything the MPs did because they thought, maybe we don't have to offer something. And that shapes, therefore, the strategy we had to have under Boris Johnson. And you can't keep on looking at it from a lens of just what's happening in Parliament, but the overall strategic game. This is where we need the EU specialist on the panel to ask whether that Well, I've got loads happen. of questions about the EU side that come from that, but I'll, I'll, I'll save them for our next conference. We'll invite you back and talk about that. But, I mean, I suppose this brings us to prorogation yes. uh, in the sense that 
the way you're talking about it, you still maintain it was absolutely the right thing to do, given the state of the negotiations at the time. Yeah, so the, the analogy that you have to think about it is Boris wasn't sitting down to a new game of chess. Mm -hmm. So if Theresa May has sat at the table, what you've got left pretty much is he's got a king and a pawn. I, I'm not a chess player, but I'm just going to get, this is the analogy. All the pieces are gone and you've got a lot arrayed against you. And so you've got very few, or to use a, an analogy in terms of the cards, you've got mm -hmm. very few cards left. You've tried everything. The Prime Minister's shown that. She stayed at the table a very long time trying this or that. They've tried to create an alliance with Labour. They've done everything. So you're kind of looking, or you're, to, to use another analogy, you're looking at the weapons cupboard and you've got a dagger and a bazooka. I think you should use Twister. <laughs> okay. So, yes. so, analogy. More analogies, more analogies. <laughs> That's what we need. And so in the context of that, you then map out with the key objective, how do we get the Prime Minister to October 16th with the chance of changing the negotiation dynamic so that the EU come to the table? Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, they have to believe that no deal is achievable because only if there is that room for manoeuvre does something change. And in the context of that, we know already we're dead in the water. So you have to immediately admit you're already dead. They will legislate against you. They don't trust you, Boris. They already don't trust you. You've got a couple of days before, once you're prime minister, before summer recess, but they will move against you in the September. That is a certainty. And Philip Hammond, you know, it was very interesting. You know, we got an awfully lot of good intel because everyone was very keen to tell the press of that, their clever ideas. And I remember the, you know, early on in July, Philip was saying, you know, oh, we've got a plan and, you know, and, and this is kind of what the legislation will do. So we know what the legislation is. We, we know from our own sources coming back it, it, the kind of the shape of it. So you've got to already bank in the things that are already going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. And then you think ahead. And then you have to factor in the Fixed Term Parliament Act. You have no way of breaking the deadlock. There is just no way through it. You've got to think about, you know, the 14K period, etc. There's no way through to go into the public. And in the context of that, what have you got left? And it's essentially about controlling time. How do you create an interval in which the Prime Minister can go and negotiate without the EU saying, well, we don't need to do business with you because you can't deliver? Mm -hmm. And so in that, you've not got many choices. And prorogation is an executive matter, not subject to a vote. And you look at the precedent, and one of the, the, my personal bugbears with John Major is he prorogued for 21 days over a recess, which is an, a direct parallel. And in addition, despite the protestations of the likes of Reeve, etc., the prorogation period both satisfies the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act, where they stitch these moments to take control in Parliament, mm -hmm. and it gets people back before October Council, and it's over the, summer, uh, over the conference recess. So there is no period of time, and we come back following the summer recess. So there's no period in time in which Parliament is actually brought, and we're not doing any legislation in that time. So it's not that we lost time to doing legislation that we needed to do. So it satisfies all these criteria, and it's a wing and a prayer, but that's all we've got. And the point was to change the dynamic. And so that's why it's important to say finally to these rebels, I'm sorry, you have rebelled and rebelled, and you've crippled one prime minister, and you're not doing it to a second. And calculations or maths, if you're gonna lose by 10, what well, doesn't really matter if you lose by another 20. So here is finally a penalty for your rebellion. Because if you won't stay with the government on the one matter that they're elected to do, then you can't be relied upon. The, the, the problem that, that I have with, with that story, which I've heard before, because you told it on, on Katie Ball's um, podcast. Don't promote other podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> is when I listen to you say that, I just want, I just think, on whose authority? On whose That's people's. <laughs> The people commanded it in a referendum. In a referendum. So why didn't Boris Johnson vote for Theresa May's deal? But Wasn't she acting on behalf of the people? Yeah, but this, this is, the deal did not pass. And it's not just by one that it didn't pass. By the biggest loss ever. Yes, but the third time round, if the Spartans had voted for it, it would have gone through. Yes. So it was actually the hardliners in the Conservative Party that prevented Brexit happening. And then Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. He was Prime Minister for one day of parliamentary scrutiny. You seem to have just admitted that he faced a prospective vote of no confidence if Parliament had been allowed to come back. How is there a democratic mandate no, wait, for sorry, shutting so down where, Parliament? Where's your conclusion that? on that? Well, you just said we were dead. They would have, they would have gone for us, et cetera, et cetera. Us, et cetera. Phrasing. Yeah. Well, do you want to call oh, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> and, and these rebels, these serial yes. rebels that yes. he threw out, yes. they included 
Philip Hammond. They included David Gork. They included Rory Stewart. They were sitting in the cabinet. They voted for the deal three times. Ken Clark voted for the deal three times. These were the people who got thrown out. It just doesn't add up to me in terms of accepting that you have accountability to parliament and you are only the government because you are acting on the authority of parliament. And yes, a referendum. But Theresa May was trying to do that too. But to, to take that point, these are MPs that were Conservative MPs who had a problem with what the government were trying to do, were legislating with the opposition, taking control of the order book, and basically crippling the government. And you'll see that right now there is a running thing on opposition days, that if a motion tries to take control of the order paper, that is a no-go, whatever the subject. And this is the point. If you are a Conservative MP and you vote to cripple the government, but you won't have the balls to vote no confidence, then I'm sorry the whip should be removed. Mark, do you want to dip your toe in these choppy waters? <laughs> Gosh, I've been enjoying this. <laughs> uh, this is absolutely fascinating to get a bit of a behind-the-scenes view. Of what, and one thing that, that I, I suspect that people like Nikki don't entirely get about the hacks is that we don't see much of what's going on under the bonnet. So it's fascinating to see how these calculations are laid bare. Uh, I, I mean, I've, dangerous ground here attempting to, to venture an opinion on the right. But I don't think anybody emerges from this wearing a, a sort of robe of purest white uh, because everybody was playing hard politics and everybody was playing the most bare-knuckle game they could, not uh, uh, excluding the opposition. And, yeah, I think Nick Brown was playing this for all he was worth to try and bring the government down and shatter the Conservative Party in the process. And that's his job. It's not remotely a criticism of him. That's what he's there to do. So you're, you're operating in an intricate tough and increasingly nasty political environment. And the people who got the whip withdrawn surely can't have been that surprised at the end of it all. I, I, yeah, I talked to Dominic Grieve quite a lot during that period, and uh, yeah, it, was hard, it was hard for any journalist in Westminster not to talk to Dominic Grieve quite a lot in that period, uh, and very interesting he was too. But I certainly didn't get the impression that he felt he had a long-term future in Conservative politics at the end of this, and he was in the happy position as you know, leading counsel. He'd go off and make twice the money for half the hours, so, uh, or probably rather more than that. Um, but you know, I think, you think you've also got a situation where a lot of people felt this was so nasty they were quite happy to walk away. Uh, and most of the people who, who lost the whip probably did not weep bitter salt tears of being out of it in the end. They were just trying to do one last thing with a kind of scorpion sting before they went. Um, where it leaves us now, though, is that we have a, a, a feeling in the Conservative Party that the whip will be cracked and that if uh, people go too far off piste... And so you watch, for example the um, phalanx of distinguished ex-cabinet ministers who are in various positions on the committee corridor and elsewhere. Um, and they're some of the most interesting people in Parliament because I think quite a lot of them, and I don't know what Karen's position is on this, uh, quite a lot of them do not feel that they, will, uh, they are permanently beyond the pearly gates. They could go back through those pearly gates into office again sometime and they conduct themselves accordingly. Uh, which is why, you know, take Robert Buckland's current demi-rebellion over um, a small aspect of the Nationality and Borders Bill. I think this is an exercise in showing your claws, but not quite sinking them into the flesh. Uh, we shall see. Claws, flesh and pearly gates, Karen. Well, <laughs> I, I was just going to make the point that I think one of the things that happened during that very, very difficult period was that Parliament actually lost touch with the public. And there was a view that the public were less enthusiastic about leaving the European Union than they had been during the referendum. And that simply wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. The public were more enthusiastic for it. There was lots of people who said, if we had a second referendum, the public would vote differently. No, they'd have voted, they'd have been so cross, they'd have voted more um, in line with Brexit than voting, changing their vote. Because they didn't want to be told what to do and they didn't want Parliament to tell them what to do. And, and I mean, I honestly think that the big mistake that Labour made, and we talk about Nick Brown being a, 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 a dousy warrior, and he certainly is, but actually, if Labour had abstained on any of those votes, it would have gone through on a split Conservative Party and the Conservative Party would have, been, would have torn itself apart totally torn itself apart. There'd have been, we'd have left the European Union, but there would have been no Conservative Party left to speak of. And 
that I think was a tactical mistake that was made and that that was because somehow Parliament had, and, and MPs had convinced themselves that the public mood had switched. And I think what we saw in the election, when it finally came in 2019, was it absolutely hadn't. The public just wanted to get Brexit done, and they just wanted it to happen, and they were going to vote and the, as they you know, did. And this is what I think Theresa May thought she was going to see in 2017, was the same kind of figures for her, because that was what was coming up on the doorstep. What we didn't, what wasn't anticipated was that sort of um, the, 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 the anti-Brexit vote coalescing around one candidate in each part, in each constituency larger, the Labour candidate. Um, and going back to two-party politics in 2017, whereas in 2019, the public just said, we've had enough. Could I, right, could I, I mean, just say one thing about uh, Labour? Totally different, well, not, not a totally different subject, but nothing about Theresa May, really, but about Labour, because Mark mentioned earlier, and that is, it's another what if in our book, should she have done a cross-party deal? And you said it would have broken the Conservative Party. I think it would have broken the Labour Party mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, I, I said at the beginning that we'd seen, well, maybe I didn't actually say at the beginning, I said that I've written quite a lot about has more power in Parliament than you think, but also another thing is that Parliament has strengthened itself. Over this. There's been a trend towards parliamentary strengthening with greater rebelliousness, with more powerful and better resourced select committees, etc., in the run-up to the Brexit period. But one of the ways in which Parliament has been disempowered is in the way that we choose party leaders. And a huge problem in this period was Corbyn, because you had a Labour Party leader who didn't even enjoy the confidence of his own parliamentary party. And I think that in that period that you were talking about, Nikki, if, whether or not I misinterpreted what you were saying, there were definitely plots over the summer as to whether an alternative government could be formed. And the primary reason that it couldn't was because of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> so actually there were problem, huge problems on the Labour side as well. And I just think it is untenable to think that you can give party members the power to pick a leader who is then expected to lead in Parliament. The Conservatives are much more sensible on this. You can vote no confidence in your parliamentary leader and they're gone like that and they cannot be re-elected. And if Labour had had that rule and had chosen somebody else in 2016, I think the things that you were talking about, Mark, would have been at least a bit more feasible. And in the end game, you might have ended up with, I don't know, would it have been Keir Starmer or Hillary Benn or Yvette Cooper or somebody able to lead a government? Uh, that might have been able to do some sort of a different deal or, you know, or whatever. It would have ended differently, I think. You can see an entire new volume of those Ian Dale alternative politics stories yeah, coming definitely. out of this. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a perfectly fair point. And one of the things about the 2019 election was that both Labour and the Lib Dems had their leadership problems in the sense that Jeremy Corbyn was hugely targeted and I think rather wilted under it, but so did Joe Swinson, which meant that the kind of the senior opposition leader who seemed to sail above all this wasn't even in Westminster in the shape of Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, and uh, she, she could just sit back and bide her time. Right, I'm going to take back control. Uh, <laughs> we, I could sit here and reminisce all day. I think this is fascinating, but we ought to sort of it's try and tackle it. <laughs> yes, we'll end this therapy session for the moment. Buy uh, my book. You can, uh... <laughs> you've said 110,000 words now. I mean, you've lost, you've lost your audience. Uh, one of the, just to pick up on one thing that Meg said, which was the link between good scrutiny and good policy. Uh, do, do we all think that holds? I mean, one thing that crosses my mind is I wonder if we'd be having the fights over the protocol we're having now if there had been more time for scrutiny, because that was rushed through quite quickly, wasn't it? I mean, do we think Parliament gets enough time to scrutinise legislation? Um, so, I, as chair of the Procedure Committee, I would say absolutely not. I yeah. think Parliament does need more time to scrutinise. I also think Parliament, we don't um, use Parliament for general debates enough and for time for MPs to vent their views and, and, and make their points. Sometimes people just want to be able to say their piece. And, and you know, during the virtual Parliament, when we had these everyone participating on on Zoom and three minute time limits. I mean, there was no scrutiny, there was no debate. It was simply everyone reading out their piece so they've got something that they can put in their local paper and on um, YouTube. And, and, you know, the debate should be a proper debate and there should be proper scrutiny and there should be time for things to, to you know, to be looked at line by line. And it does make for better policy because it does mean that the policy that is developed in Whitehall, which is 
usually utterly brilliant and the underpinning underneath it is utterly brilliant and there's a reason why we have right rounds and we have this long way of doing things which is incredibly frustrating I know for anyone who comes into government and says, why can't I just do it like this but collective responsibility means we have very strong um, governments who are able to deliver because every every member of the government has signed up to the policy even if they didn't have a chance to look at it actually both making the point that I think during the, the pandemic when we went to more cobra government so it wasn't government by right round with detailed scrutiny it was just ministers in a room making a decision on the hoof I think we did and they did see that actually there wasn't the underpinning behind some of the policies and some of the policies did fall down because of that lack of underpinning that the, the the scrutiny and the right round and everything else gives us but it's then how do you translate that scrutiny that's already happened in Whitehall into scrutiny in Parliament so that MPs can understand it and Meg made the point that it's the government back benches that perhaps are the most powerful I think that's you know we've seen more of that particularly during Covid that it was rebellions and I'm, I was one of them at one point several times um, <laughs> rebellions by back benches where it when, on my case it was always because I just went this is hasn't been thought through this is not a policy that has any proper underpinning behind it and it will collapse and fall down and I'm not voting for bad law and and I think so we saw both policy made on the hoof but then Parliament scrutinizing things in insufficient time you know I think we had one debate that was a three-hour debate we had something like 90 speakers in the three hours I mean it was just impossible to get all the points across and and that meant that things went through that arguably could have been an awful lot better if there had been more time devoted by Parliament to unpick those problems with whips also that we've said, whips at the beginning of the process saying, you know, can we just challenge this? Can we check this is okay? Scrutiny does make for better policy. However much, as a minister, you hate the call that says a UQ has gone in this morning and you're answering it, minister, that is not a pleasant place to be, but you've got to be able to go out there and defend that policy, and that means that you challenge. Mark? I uh, completely agree with pretty much all of that, and even in normal times, if you like, in inverted commas, I think that... Uh, a lot of, I mean, things like report stage in the House of Commons can often be absolutely farcical. The, the wacky grouping of amendments, the selection, and really quite substantial par, um, propositions that probably don't cut too much across government policy but have cross party support just sort of disappear with a flip of the chairman of Ways and Means hands. And um, it's worth noting that there is one section of the legislative process that the government doesn't control. And that's report stage in the House of Lords. And that's where um, many of the, in fact, all of the troubles on current bills actually emanate from. So yeah, was it Nationality and Borders Bill, 19 amendments, Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, similar sort of number, okay. big amendments to the Health and Care Bill, and just watch for the uh, election bill as it comes through report stage in the House of Lords next week, because uh, the solids are really going to hit the air conditioning over that one. But in the meantime, you have the situation where a lot of these issues are fired back to the House of Commons, uh, and the um, any, any uh, impertinent changes their lordships have, might have made are, are just rapidly dismissed rather than debated. Incidentally, one small footnote here is during the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, the government at report stage in the House of Lords attempted to in introduce a vast suite of swinging new public order offences. You can be in favour of them, you can be against them, but they're big and they would have made a great deal of difference to the conduct of protest in this country. And they were being introduced in the House of Lords, the bill already having gone through the Commons, and had they been fired back to the Commons, would have had a pretty minimal debate, if any at all, at that stage. Their Lordships rejected them out of hand, so they, they won't be seen then, but will probably rematerialise after the next Queen's speech. Um, so you've got that part of it. One other bit of scrutiny that's well worth flagging up as well is just legislative consent motions from the devolved assemblies. Now, th these are treated as if there's like, it's, it's kind of like clicking accept all cookies or I accept the terms and conditions. Uh, and they deeply, deeply resent when their concerns are simply ignored. That's quite a problem and it's going to be a bigger one. Karen, do you just want to come in quickly on something? Yes, yeah, so just two points on that. First of all, I mean, we shouldn't forget that what's said in Parliament does have implications in the real world. I know it's sometimes difficult to believe. Now, my background is I'm a tax accountant. I used to work on doing tax returns for 
business and individuals. And you can, of course, look at Hansard to look at what the intent of ministers is behind a piece of legislation. And so I'm talking about here sort of the, the 90s and, and the 2000s when I was looking at things. So don't let's think that scrutiny has suddenly got worse because you would look at something and the, you know, what does the general anti-avoidance uh, measure mean in the 19, uh, in the 2006 low, uh, debt instrument bill? And it would be um, an anti-avoidance is that businesses pay their fair share of tax. Well, what does that mean in the real world? What is the fair share of tax? How do you define that? So, you know, and, and second reading debates effectively, what, what you get it is often at committee stage that someone will stand up and say the same overarching debate rather than a specific debate about the clause we're speaking about uh, that's being scrutinised at the time is not helpful in the real world when you're trying to get things done. The second point I'd just make is about LCMs. The, my committee is carrying out a, a piece of work at the moment looking at the way that the four legislatures of the United Kingdom work together. And the evidence we have received from uh, the three devolved parliaments around the way LCMs work is just, well, it's brutal. And it's uh, overwhelmingly unanimous that LCMs are just an appalling situation at the moment, including, I mean, talk about rubber stamping, having to, answer, to, to sign off an LCM after a bill has got royal assent. I mean, you know, if we really are serious about making um, devolution work and about making all parts of the United Kingdom feel that they're part of this process, you can't turn around with three minutes notice and say, oh, by the way, can you sign this LCM off because it's already had royal assent, but we just need it as a nice to have. It's not acceptable. I suspect quite a few of these issues will be touched on in the next session, but Nikki, on this question of scrutiny. Uh, so pick up a couple of things. Again, there, there's the, the creating conditions for additional scrutiny, uh, and then there's the actually taking up that opportunity. So uh, when bills are programmed, so programming happens a lot in the Commons, mm. and I, I, you know, at root is, is, is at the pace at which a bill moves, that is negotiated in usual channels. The opposition always get the business in advance, and there's a discussion. You know, how, you know, how many days do you want for a report? What feels right for you, et cetera? And so in as much as people might complain publicly or Labour might say, oh, there's not enough time for this bill, behind the scenes, they signed up to it and said, yeah, that feels about right. And if you don't mind, we're planning a big parliamentary event, and it'd be quite nice if you could let our MP, you know, can we get rid of the, the votes on that day? So we can, so that's kind of, there's, 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 the, there's, the, there's the, 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 the presenting of the issue, and then there's some of what actually happens behind the scenes, which, which is important. So there are abilities to negotiate for more time for bills, mm -hmm. both in usual channels and also backbenchers. So if a group of backbenchers are concerned about a particular bill, and they go and speak to the whips, Particularly if they're getting, you know, if there's 25 of them, you know, 30, you're getting into defeat territory, the threshold being around 40. If that number of MPs go and say, we really want this to slow down, then the whips are more likely than not to give that time. They will bend over backwards. And so there's a degree to which a sort of forced helplessness that can be challenged a little bit. I do think there is a trend towards greater use of statutory instruments. I was personally, I was on maternity leave when, the, when it happened, although actually the vast majority of COVID le legislation actually did not go down through under the Coronavirus Act. The secondary legislation was largely under the earlier Public Health Act. Mm -hmm. I do have a concern about the use of secondary legislation. Whitehall is addicted, in my view. It, it, it's the nature of it. If you're looking for an easy path and mm -hmm. you, you, know, you haven't got your policy ready and you know, they go, oh, can we just take a power and come back to it later? I think there is a default in that. I, 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 and, I, and I think you know, the more you can have on the face of the bill, the more constraints you can have around a power, I think that's important. We've all seen that the numbers of pages of legislation secondary go like this and the, the, the primary is, is like this. We've got to tackle that. But I would also say it also needs to take into account the need to do business as a government. And that is, you know, and so you have to balance the two things. So when people come forward with very complicated natures of a, you know, an additional scrutiny measure, I would just say, well, just put more to affirmative. You know, look at that. You know, I think it's, it's right to, we'll go too much into the detail, but you can look at how debates are granted, et cetera. On LCMs, I would like to know the example because behind, the, coming back to Mark's point of behind the scenes, sometimes, for example, there was an LCM in which a lot of notice was given, there was a bit of a mess up at the Scottish end, the officials didn't get it to the minister in time, then there was a lot of public declaring and wailing and gnashing of teeth, but actually the, what was actually was basically some administrative errors. So again, we've, the, the problem is, and maybe it is because not much is seen from behind the scenes, is that sometimes political point scoring can be made, particularly in the region of LCMs, which doesn't necessarily take into account 
the comp both sides of the particular. I can tale. assure you it wasn't Scotland in this okay, case. Okay, all right, in that case. <laughs> and what, what do you make then of the suggestion that with all that body of retained EU law, there's going to be some sort of special procedure to hasten our ability to change it? Because there's an awful lot of law with them. Yeah, there's about 1,500, I believe, is the element of. I mean, part of this is going to be pragmatism. I mean, if you just look at the, look at the last legislative session, you know, a government has to get on with its programme. You have a limit of about 25 to 27 decent bills in a year-long session. Mm -hmm. You're going to probably want to do a lot of that that's politically salient, and you try and reduce the amount of legislation that's tidying. So where you have changes which are largely tidying, or basically, the, you know, there was always a default by, by, by some departments of saying, oh, let's just copy and lift the EU stuff, you know, rather than a, well, do we think it's any good? And so if you are going to get through that 1500, then you probably need to do some sort of bucketing of how do you look at this? You know, and and that, that's probably what I would, I would imagine the Brexit Freedoms Bill is much like the EU withdrawal bill. It creates the framework in which things look at it with different classes of sort of, you know, and you probably look at, you know, what does this, what kind of things do these particular bits of law affect? I mean, you know, there's ways of doing it in a way that that addresses the concerns and creates a framework for you revisiting that. So, no, you know, do do I think the 1500 bits of retained EU law should be done by negative S? I know, but I probably don't think that a blanket rule is the okay. most appropriate rule. Nor do I think it would be appropriate to have 1500 bills. In primary legislation, because mm -hmm. you just—I mean, you know, parliament, you know, people will be going, "Well, what have you been doing 15 years later as you gradually churn through this?" I mean, right. that, that's 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 to that's to basically calcify our legislative system because we've inherited so much from the EU, and that's not pragmatic either. Okay, so Meg, so on this question of scrutiny, but also I think to a related issue, which is the, real, the issue of who controls parliamentary time. And I'm keen to ask that partly because it means I've finally got to a question on Slido <laughs> uh, about whether we should have a business committee that uh, sets the Commons agenda. Mm -hmm. But I think that's quite closely linked to this issue of scrutiny, whether or not Parliament could and should have greater control over its own agenda. Yeah, OK. Maybe I could say two brief things about things that have come from the other mm -hmm. end of the table and then, and then come back to that. It's interesting that we're, we're having this conversation about programme motions because Robert Buckland mentioned programme motions earlier as a sort of a, a, a bad a step in the wrong direction by Labour um, to give control uh, of the agenda to the, to the government. Nikki makes them sound very sort of consensual. And I, I mean, I accept what you say, that there is a lot of discussion behind the scenes with the whips and so on. But what there isn't is the ability on the floor of the House to amend them. And of course, one, uh, one of the sort of last... Um, big rows on Brexit was over Boris Johnson's withdrawal agreement bill where the proposal was that it should have three days in the programme motion. The programme motion got voted down because that's all that MPs can do, vote it down. If they'd been able to amend it and say, well, maybe not three days, but 10 days or something, maybe that could have been got through. In the end, he just withdrew the bill and pushed, pushed for a general election. So personally, I would see it as a good thing if we could have a bit more control on the floor of the House of Commons, not just leave it to whips, but actually have a vote on not just whether the program motion itself stands or falls, but whether you want to change it in any way. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a step in the right direction. On the retained EU law point, this all seems very hazy at the moment. And I, I think this is something that people really have to watch out for because you're talking about the 1500 things and I, I, you know, that, 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 that's, that's a lot. It's not surprising it's a lot after all of the decades that we spent in the EU. And of course, for decades, there were whole areas of law where we did not have control. So environmental protection measures, consumer protection measures, uh, employment protection measures, and so on, a great deal of that was coming from the EU. And fair enough, you say, Brexit, we're not doing that anymore. We want to send power back to the UK Parliament to make these decisions. But the, if that's going to happen, it really does need to happen. People in the UK Parliament really do need to take active decisions if they want to change some of these policies, because they weren't actually all imposed on us completely reluctantly. We were part of the negotiating process. A lot of that policy is um, pretty controversial within parties as well as between them. And I think that is, there is a responsibility on the government to put changes of, major changes of policy that flows from EU law to Parliament and for MPs to actually scrutinise them and decide if they want them. Because it's one thing to say, we're bringing power back to the UK Parliament, and yes, we have a government which doesn't like some of these measures, and fair enough, it's got an 80-seat majority, let, it, let them vote to overturn them. But to dodge Parliament 
and just overturn them without that, I think would actually be contrary to the whole taking back control narrative, the original one from, from the referendum. And in, yeah, I mean, you called this panel taking back control. We called this report taking back control, which is a report the Constitution Unit published last January about Parliament getting more control of its business. Um, purely a coincidence that we both chose the same title, I, I, I'm sure. Um, I think there are... I, and, and on the business committee point, I mean, I was a specialist advisor to the right committee, which the, the right committee on reform of the House of Commons, which proposed that we should have a business committee. That never was brought into effect. To be honest, I was always sceptical about a business committee um, because it all depends who's on the committee and so on. I think it's, it wouldn't be a bad thing, but it wouldn't necessarily change the terms of trade because if it was just a meeting between whips that was formalised, you'd get more or less the same outcomes. I think what matters is the chamber. And one of the other things that the right committee proposed was that there should be a vote on the timetable for the week in the chamber, which gives some power to government backbenchers if they're not happy with things. And if they can side with the opposition and say we need a bit more time on X or a bit less time on Y, mm -hmm. I think that would be a good thing. The other thing that, um, and I'm afraid Nikki was part of, of, of doing this, I'm sure she would, she would defend it, but um, during those Brexit years, we saw the extent to which the government has control over the time that goes to the opposition. Uh, so the opposition is guaranteed a certain number of days per session, but the government can hoard them up. We had a whole five-month period during Brexit when the opposition got no, no days at all. I think that was wrong. And actually, going back to some of the things that Mark was saying about, you know, we, had, we didn't really know what Brexit meant. Was it customs union? Was it single market? And so on. In my interviews for the book, actually one of the leading Brexiteers said to me that when it got to the indicative votes... That was a discussion that probably should have happened a very long time before about whether you wanted to take all of those things off the table. And if the opposition time had been used to have those discussions, if it had been made available and used, then perhaps actually that would have been good for Theresa May because those things would have been dismissed and the support for her deal would have been greater. But by blocking the opposition days, those debates couldn't happen. So I, I think more power to Parliament to set its own agenda in various ways. I would also give it the power to vote on prorogation, by the way, as well as on uh, when it adjourns for the summer recess and power to be recalled uh, if it has been, um, if it is in recess and there are important things to discuss. I'm almost tempted to say we should do a whole day on counterfactual sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but Karen, Karen first again. So just a couple of points. First of all, on programme motions, let's not forget that the programme motion on House of Lords reform is the thing that scuppered House of Lords reform. It wasn't yep. the second reading vote. It was the programme motion. And um, I was a big fan of indicative votes. I was very much in favour of trying to have indicative votes because I thought it's almost like that sort of... Um, you know, you can't have your absolute ideal because there isn't a majority for your absolute ideal. So your second choice might well have ended up being what, in, what, what transpired to be largely the deal that Theresa May had. And I think we should have used the indicative votes process earlier. But I would just say that do, trying to do it as an opposition motion um, or using opposition days for it, instinctively government members do not want to vote for mo motions that the opposition bring forward. It is just a uh, something that feels mm -hmm. wrong. And that is true of parliaments through the ages. It doesn't matter whether you look to 97 to 2010, when government members w voted against opposition motions that were in absolutely, in love. Look, you know, I use them politically. Here's the EDM that my, my opponent has signed. And look, here's the motion of the opposition day that they voted against. How can they sign an EDM and vote against a motion? It's because it's an opposition day. So I think the idea that opposition days can be used to, to draw these things out is, is it, in reality just doesn't happen. But if it had been time that was set aside much earlier to allow the ideas around customs union and single market access and all that kind of thing to have been tested in Parliament, even second referendum, I don't think there was ever a majority in Parliament for a second referendum, but we never we never had a vote to test it. And, and I think that if that had happened and Parliament could say, actually, there isn't a majority for this, we might have made some progress. I still suspect that... Ultimately, that it was a divided mm. parliament and a divided country on an issue that we hadn't fleshed out what the whole thing meant, and therefore we probably would never have got there. But um, at least it might have been we'd have had slightly less fractiousness, perhaps. I mean, throughout that period, one of the things that really fascinated me was for all the talk about a new sort of Brexit divide that cut across parties, the way that 
party loyalties and tribalism mm. reasserted themselves. Because mm. what you said about the government mm. applies to Labour as well. Why were so many Labour MPs unwilling to vote for Theresa yeah. May's deal? Because it was Theresa May's mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, rather than because of the sustenance. But, Nikki? I was just going to pick up on opposition. I, I think it's worth bearing in mind, and again, to what's happening behind the scenes is relevant. There were two schools of thought. You'll have guessed by now that I thought favour a fairly, you know, firm approach. You know, and you know, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to go down, you know, be it on your your feet rather than on your knees. And and essentially, there were two schools of thought. There was Julian Smith as chief whip to Theresa May. Uh, and it, it emerged initially, so first of all, you have Gavin Williamson and his approach to opposition days where he creates the situation. You know, and, you know, and I go back and forth. You know, I, I, the difficulty is you are shaped by your parliamentary experiences. And I come from a hinterland of opposition where you value opposition days and you vote on them because when your turn comes again to be in opposition, that may be your only, mm. your, you know, the only thing you have. And so therefore you don't break that convention. And there was some egregious abuse. So for example, we won't go too much detail, but the nursery's SI, which started to provoke the advent of the humble dress and those kind of things, and you start to come, have that come through. So I agree. I would, you know, there was a a a, a dominant a philosophy that was one of the which is either you know we should take things head on, don't let them gather steam. If you've got a customs union amendment, it goes down. See them down. Go for it now because it will get worse. And I will always say it will. The longer you leave something out there to gather amendments and signatories, the worse it gets. You do. You may gain time, but they gain time too. They're they're assembling their troops at the same time as you are assembling your troops. You're unlikely to win. And so from that perspective. Opday should have been stitched in. We probably should have taken some fights because I think it has created now a situation in which uh, so sort of the, the the strength has gone out or, or the, the feeling that you know or do we have to do this opday and it makes it makes for a slightly weaker parliamentary party in terms of sticky votes. Mm. Although I say against that, the, the um, more generally just on, on prorogation again, need to look at it in the round of a vote. Make. The issue about the end of the prorogation date is it creates an issue for the ping pong of the final bills in each session. So you create the wiggle room, prorogation dates are always a range of dates, to create the flexibility for the Lord's business managers to avoid bills crashing. And so that's relevant, and therefore having an advanced vote when actually a lot of things are going to be changing quite quickly in the Lords, it, it's, it's kind of all those kind of things coming together. I think a business committee, you know, your right to direct the business of Parliament comes from winning an election, and that belongs to the executive. OK, we've got a minute left, and this question, I mean, I've ignored Slido, not because I wanted to ignore Slido, because I thought this is fascinating, but this question has come up in various guises. It won't surprise any of you, I don't suppose, but we're going to pose it. And you've got a few seconds each, or you're keeping me from food, which you shouldn't do. Uh, should misleading the Commons be a resigning offence, and are there ways that Parliament can be better empowered to enforce this if it should? Mark. Tam Diel once said in the Chamber that truth in this place is the fulcrum of our system. Absolutely. If you can't believe what a minister said, if a, if a direct lie and bear in mind that there is quite a lot between misremembered, misunderstood, slip of the tongue and direct conscious lie. But if you can't, if a direct conscious lie in the Chamber of the Commons goes unpunished, well, what then? Um, I, I wrote down in anticipation of this question the words from the Ministerial Code, page one. Ministers who knowingly mislead Parliament will be expected to offer their resignation to the Prime Minister. That has always been the case. Off the top of your head? Like you remember the Ministerial <laughs> Code? Oh, it's here, it's here. But it's short, it's short and snappy enough to remember, <laughs> potentially. Um, the problem in, that, sen in that, that sentence, obviously, is Prime Minister. So what if it is the Prime Minister who's in this position? That makes it somewhat tricky. Um, and I would come back to something that we've, we've kind of spoken about several times, that Nick, one of the things that Nikki and I seem to um, agree on, that in the end, the people who matter are government backbenchers. And I would say in our political constitution, we have a political, not a legal constitution, we have the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. What that means in the end is that the keepers of the constitution, the keepers of constitutional standards are... MPs, which means in practice MPs on the governing party benches. So if you have somebody in that position who doesn't resign, if you want to stick to the way uh, that things have always operated, as Mark indicates, it is the duty of MPs to do something about it, and that means the government's backbenchers. Thank you. 
I, I uphold the ministerial code. If somebody, I mean, I, I agree on, on the gradation. So, you know, if somebody is sent up to the dispatch box and has a line that's been put in saying this is the statistic and they dutifully repeat it and then it turns out to be false, they could come, they must correct it. So do I think, you know, because I think you could accidentally wipe out quite a lot of the government quite quickly <laughs> of, of all ilks just, and, 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 the, and the paralyzing effect on civil servants writing those briefing papers <laughs> would probably get very, very strong. But if you knowingly mislead and particularly particularly on matters of, of great political importance or things that really matter to the public, it is very, very important how our parliament looks and how our politicians mm -hmm. behave. And, and so, yeah. Um, Karen? I agree with everything that's been said. Perfect. <laughs> well, listen, I don't know about you lot, but I thought that was utterly fascinating. So I'd like to thank Mark and Meg and Nikki and Karen. Karen, you can go away knowing that you matter. Uh, one, of the, one of the few things that people seem to agree on on this panel. So there we go. I hope that makes you feel better. And we're now going to break for lunch. Uh, but can you join me in thanking this panel for a fascinating discussion? That was super.